Good morning, Southwest. Good to see everyone here this morning. If you're joining us online or here in person, we're so glad you came to join us this morning. Let's stand and worship together. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. You look good. You look good from here. Uh, welcome to Southwest Community Church. If you're visiting or new, we like to say we are family of families. So welcome to our family. So glad you've joined to worship with us today. And uh, we like to start our service by preparing our hearts for worship. We do that by reading scripture and praying aloud together. And so this month we're focusing on Psalm 128. I'll read the regular text. If you'll join me with the uh, bold text out loud, I'd appreciate it. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Psalm 128, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Please join me. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. 
The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. The psalm reminds us to fear the Lord, and as we do fear the Lord, he blesses our efforts and he blesses our lives. And so it, it really is that reminder to see God for who he is. He's holy, he's sovereign, he's just. And so as we continue to prepare our hearts for worship, I'm just gonna give you a moment of silent prayer and this is your time to commune with your heavenly father. If you've walked into this room with unrepented sin, I'd encourage you, now's a good time to repent of your sin so that your heart's full and you're ready to receive his word and to worship him in spirit and in truth. So let's just have a moment of silent prayer together. Let's do that together. So God, as we come into this space, we do so recognizing that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And so we hold you in high regard. We understand that you are holy, that you are perfect in all your ways and you are sovereign over life. And so today we're reminded to bow the knee to you. For when we see you in your perfection, we are reminded of our own imperfection and our sinful nature. So God, forgive us for our sin, forgive us where we fall short. Forgive us even if we walked into this place today with wrong motives or unrepented sin. We wanna be right before you. Our desire is that you speak to us and that you transform us from the inside out by the word of your truth and so today we worship you, we exalt the name of Jesus Christ, and we pray that you would continue to do your work in and through us, and you would continue to build your church. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's continue to sing this morning.
50 says praise the Lord praise God in his sanctuary praise him in his mighty heaven praise him for his mighty deeds praise him according to his excellent greatness let all that has breath praise the Lord praise the Lord I'd invite us in this next song to not just read the words on the screen but use this time as a moment to really worship the God of the universe and the God we serve and take this time to really praise him for who he is so let's sing together Every heart. 
Well, good morning, Southwest Community Church. My name is Abby Vincent. I am an upcoming senior here at Southwest. It is so good to see all of you, whether you are online or in person, we are so glad that you are here. Um, I've been here for 17 years, which is my entire life. Um, and my favorite part about Southwest is the fact that we are a family of families. And because of that, I would encourage you to turn to those around you and just say hello. back to your seats, you're going to see that the ushers are coming up the aisles with the registers. I would highly encourage you to fill one of these out. It is your way to let us know that you are here this morning. Um, I believe there's a link also if you're online. Uh, the most important part of those registers is the prayer request at the very bottom. Um, our church truly believes in the power of prayer, and because of that, if you fill that out, one of our pastors or elders will pray for you throughout the week, and I know that's a huge encouragement to me, so I would encourage you to fill one of those out for yourself. Um, we also have worship guides, and they're pretty cool, they're, so you can follow along um, when Pastor Arnie preaches, they're pretty helpful, and if you have little kids, we've also got family worship guides as well, which are in the back of the Welcome Center. If you didn't get a worship guide and you would like one, or if you misplaced yours, just raise your hand, um, and one of our ushers will give you one of those. Uh, would you please join me in prayer for Pastor Arnie as he comes up? Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that we are able to gather here this morning. It is such a beautiful day outside, um, and it is so encouraging to see each one of these lovely people in here. Um, I pray for Pastor Arnie. I pray that you would give him the words and that you would give us open hearts to hear him. I pray that we would hear not him but you, Lord, and that he would speak truth boldly, um, and that it would just be awesome. <laughs> um, in your name I pray, amen. again. So glad you're here. Uh, welcome to Southwest Community Church. Uh, we love to open up the Bible and we love to pick books of the Bible and we walk through them verse by verse. We do that for a couple reasons. Number one, it's the strongest form of discipleship and we believe in discipleship at this place. And number two, we don't get to pick and choose uh, what to speak on or what to talk about. Uh, we believe in preaching and teaching the entire council of God. And so today here in a few minutes, we will be back in first Peter. We took a couple week break. Uh, we had some special services going on, but today we will be back in first Peter. And today, men, you're on the hot seat. All right. So get ready. Okay. We have one that's one that's ready. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, and a couple that want to leave. Don't just stay here. It's going to be okay. Uh, but before I get to uh, First Peter, though, I would like to uh, highlight next week's going to be a special week. We have a worship director candidate coming in for candidating weekend. His name is Kyle Bryant, and his uh, and his wife Nicole will be with us next weekend. And a couple of special events. If you're part of any of the worship or the tech team, uh, you can show up for a meal on Thursday night. There'll be a little bit of get to know him before rehearsal. Uh, and then church wide next Saturday at 9 a.m. for an hour uh, out here in the Welcome Center will be kind of a meet and greet and a QA and a uh, so that you can get to know him as well. And then he'll be leading both services next week. And then in the middle hour in our community hour uh, right here in this room, we'll have another Q&A uh, so that you can get to know he and his wife, ask any questions you might have. And then after that second service will be an official business meeting where we will be voting on him and also another elder kind of coming on the board. So please be here next week. Uh, we are super, super excited about this uh, possibility. The minute you meet he and his wife, you will fall in love with them the way I did. They have wonderful hearts, very gifted uh, in not only uh, leading worship, but in ministry as a whole. He's been in ministry for many, many years. And so uh, I said this first hour last week, I'll say it second hour this week, because I'm getting this question over and over and over. What about Maya? Are we going to lose Maya? Are you kicking Maya out the door? Yes, we've kicked her out the door many years ago. Um, <laughs> But we're actually keeping her in the building, and she will still be involved in worship. Um, so uh, we thank her for kind of filling the gap for a year and a half. Yeah, you can thank Maya for that. Um, she's a keeper. We'll keep her um, around for a little while longer. Um, we, we love her and glad she's decided to stay with us to join Kyle in helping us uh, lead worship. Also today, this time of year, I would also like to highlight and recognize the graduates. So both high school and college graduates, there's a list of names behind me. Uh, you can look at those, but if we have any of those in the room, could I have you stand any college or high school grads? Anybody in the room? Do we have any? Hey, we have one. Okay. Remain standing. I'm going to pray for you and the graduates. We, we had a few first hour as well, which, by the way, I'm just going to say this to the second hour. Guys, do better. Invite more people. There, there's some empty chairs. here. No, I'm just playing. Um, uh, so glad you're here. Let me pray for, uh, for the seniors. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. And for those both in high school and in college that have kind of finished this chapter of their educational career. And I know many of them now are moving on to the next chapter and making decisions for their life. And so I just pray that you would be at the forefront of those decisions, that you would be at the forefront of their minds as they make these decisions and as they transition from one phase of life to the next, God, that you would just go before them and ultimately that they would live and to glorify and honor you uh, with their lives. And so we just thank you that we are a church that invests in and pours into both college students and high school students. Uh, God, we pray that they would stand as strong Christian men and women for you in a world that needs your light and your gospel. Pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Give it up again for our one senior who, uh, who's with us. Hey, hey. Fantastic. So, uh, so we are back in First Peter. You can go to First uh, Peter chapter three. Uh, I'm picking up the pace today. Uh, we've kind of been going a little slow through First Peter. So today, I thought we would do verse, just one verse, uh, verse seven. Uh, so we are, uh, uh, we are going to hit this verse. But the last couple of weeks, we've been encouraging the women with really biblical encouragement for women to really to really gain and understand their biblical power, the power of submission, power of conduct, the power of their internal beauty and their holiness. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Last week, uh, as we celebrated Mother's Day, we encouraged the women to be godly women, to use the gifts and abilities that God's given you, not only in the church, but in the community. And I reminded the women last week that we need you. We need your grace, we need your love, we need your leadership, we need your mentorship. 
in this place. We, we uh, looked at a passage out of Titus last week. We, there was a challenge to the older women and younger women. And then today, as we open up 1 Peter chapter 3, and we look at this one powerful verse, now we're looking at the men. And so, men, I just want to tell you this right from the beginning. Uh, today's your day, and I'm going to come out strong, and I'm going to come out uh, really talking to men as a man. Uh, in other words, we're, we're going to have a manly conversation. And so I don't want to leave the women behind, but women, if you are with us, I would just ask you today, just, just pray for the men. Pray for the men in the building. Pray for the men in your life. Uh, pray for the men in our community, because I believe we live in a day and age where we are losing men. We are losing the concept of even what it means to be a man and how God has designed and gifted and called and crafted men to be men. And so today is going to be all about the men. And now don't lose sight of the overarching theme of 1 Peter, though, because the overarching theme is the power of the gospel. And so whether you're a female or whether you're a male, whether you're a parent or a non-parent, doesn't matter. We all need the power of the gospel. The only way you and I can live a godly life for the glory of God, and the only way we can apply these kind of passages to our lives isn't in our own strength. It isn't, a, it isn't us pulling our bootstraps up so that we can be stronger men. It's us bowing the knee to a holy God and living in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be who he's called us to be, whether you're male or female. So never lose sight of the thing of what Peter is talking about here. He's talking about the power of the gospel. And so today we're going to see that once again in our personal lives. And think about it this way. See, the power of the gospel isn't just theoretical. It's not just theological. It's not just something that we talk about. See, the power of the gospel changes who we are. It impacts our lives, and it must impact our intimate relationships. Because if the power of the gospel doesn't change how I relate to people, then where's the power of the gospel? In other words, the power of the gospel isn't just to save us. It isn't just so that we have an eternal destiny. It isn't just a ticket into heaven. It's for the here and the now. It's for today. It's for you and I to live as men and women in a godly way to be light in a very dark world. So today, remember the power of the gospel, even as I lean into the men, even as Peter gives words specifically to husbands, but then I will conclude the message with just some challenges to overall men, whether you're married or not. But Peter wants us to hone in on husbands to begin with. And let me start by saying this, our world needs solid, strong Christian men, Christian men who know God, who know his word, and are willing to stand for the truth of God's word. And we live in a world and a day and age and in a culture that needs it more than ever. We need men. And it's interesting because a couple of weeks ago when I was talking to the women, I said, hey, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be hitting the men. So men, get ready. I'm going to come out strong. Do you know what I've gotten for the last two weeks? I've gotten comments from women. And what do you think the, the most frequent comment I've gotten from all the women in two weeks is? Oh, man, Arn, don't be too hard on them. Don't, 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 don't be too hard. Don't, don't come out too strong, right? And, and I think this is a microcosm to what's going on in our culture, right? Like, like women think they need to protect their men from something, and, and, and I don't understand the mentality. Like, I don't know if some of the women at this church are afraid that they're going to get into a car and just watch the sobbing of the men all the way home. I, 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 I don't know, but I will say this to the men, Quit hiding behind the skirts of women. Stand up and be the man that God's called you to be. And so today, I, I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm going to come out strong. We're, we're really going to have a locker, locker room talk because I've been in some of the most pressure cooking, strongest, most intense locker rooms in the country at the college level. And that's where stuff gets very real. And today we're going to be really real, men. And I'm going to be real with you. And, and here's why. I'm coming at you strong because I have a passion 
for men, and I have a passion for the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ. And the church of Jesus Christ today needs real men. Men that will step up, own their faith, own their walk, own their character, own who they are, and begin to lead in their homes, but lead in a way that God has called us to lead. See, we need men who know what they believe and through the grace and strength of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will not only walk the word and talk the word, but fulfill their role as a man, not only in their home, but in the church and in the community and the world. Men, we need you. I need you. I need brothers around me. I need men who know what it means to be a true man that'll take on responsibility for their own Christian walk and their own decisions in life. See, we need men who know how to love God deeply and out of that deep, deep love for God can love their communities and their world, especially their families. And we're gonna start with Peter's words, their wife. So today's going to be straight talk. Today's going to be to the men. Women, please pray for the men in your life as I speak. And maybe there are hints that you can pick up as women how to interact and talk to and engage with men. So today, let's look at the words from Peter. Because there's a lot of passion in my heart for this and for men and to help men develop and to help men grow. Years ago, probably 25 years ago, maybe 30, I don't remember if it was Bible college or seminary, I, I can't remember, but, but somebody challenged me to write a life purpose statement. And probably many of you have done this somewhere in your career or in your life, but, but the challenge was write a purpose statement that, that'll transcend the rest of your life. And so, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, I wrote my purpose statement, and it is this. I exist as a leader to empower others to become all they can be for Jesus Christ and for his kingdom. Couple key phrases there. Number one, God has given me a gift and a calling to be a leader, so I'm, I'm going to lead wherever I am. So that's a calling that comes from him, but I'm going to lead not for my own purposes, not for my own glory, but for, for his glory and for the purpose of the church, meaning I exist as a leader to empower others, both men and women, to become all that they can be for Jesus Christ and for his kingdom. And here's why I believe that, because the chief end of man is to bring glory to God, to glory glorify God. So if the chief end of man is to glorify God, then the reality is, especially as men and women, we must live to our highest or fullest potential so that we can use that to bring him more glory. But here's what I see in our day and age, and especially with our young men, and this is coming out of six years of working on college campuses with college students. I'm seeing these young boys not becoming men. They get stuck. Not only are they not living to their fullest potential, a lot of them have just given up on even trying. And so maybe an honest question every man in the room needs to answer, whether you're married or single, is this. Am I functioning and living to my full potential? In other words, am I there? Am am I somewhere in the process? Am I moving forward toward godliness and his calling and his potential of my life? Because I'm a firm believer. I'm not going to stop until I'm dead and in the ground because God's church and his kingdom and his gospel is worth it. And it's worth my effort. It's the most important thing we can give our lives to as men. So think through your own life. How are you functioning with your relationship with God and are you living to your fullest potential? And how are you investing into others to help them get there? And so today, this message is coming out of my heart for men, both old and young. Because I believe God has given us a heavy responsibility to lead in our homes, to lead in our church, and to lead in the community. And our culture is not only saying the opposite, it's rewarding the opposite. It's suppressing men, putting them in a closet, letting them hide behind the skirts of women, 
And men are, are taking this as the new normal and they're okay with it. And I'm here to say this morning that I'm not okay with it and I don't think God's okay with it because we are shirking our God-given, God-calling responsibilities. So let's start with the husbands in the room because that's where Peter is. One verse, here it is, 3, 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Powerful verse, strong verse, speaking to the men, specifically the husbands. So if you're not a husband this morning, I'll get to you towards the end of the message. But even if you're single, if you, even if you're a man single, you need to hear these words too because it'll help you understand that maybe in your future, if you are married, what Peter is encouraging married men to be and how to treat their wives and how to love their wives. So let's start, let's dive in. We, we start with the first word, which is likewise. And we've said this before, that word likewise is a connecting word, which means we have to put it in context. So when you see the word likewise, you have to travel back up through the passage. And so if you do, you all go all the way back to verse chapter one that also uses the word likewise, right? Because if you go to verse one, it says, likewise, wives be subject to your own husband. So that tells you that's another connecting word likewise you've got to travel all the way back up to chapter 2 verses 13 through 25 to look at the context of what Peter is talking about and what he is saying there is this as we travel all the way back he's saying remember that there's God-given authority and we all need to submit to that authority So we're still in this context of God's design for human life. And he talks about submitting to government and he talks about wives submitting to husbands. But the reality is this, we all have authority over us, primarily God himself. So we submit to God, we submit to his word, we we submit to what he says. And then there are God-given authorities in your life and in my life that we all submit to. So that is the context when we read the words, likewise. And we can sum all of that up with chapter 2, verse 19, that says this, For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. There's the context. In other words, view the world as God views the world. God's sovereign, God's in control. He has, he has everything in his control even when we endure sorrows and suffering unjustly. That's, that's really what Peter is saying here. He says, if you have the right mindset of who God is and his sovereign will and his sovereign act in the, on the planet and in your life and in my life, then we will be able to handle the sufferings and hardships of this life, even if they are unjust in a godly fashion. That's the context. Keep our eyes solely focused on God. And as we do, we will have the capacity to graciously endure hardship. So within that context, Peter goes on and says, by the way, wives, put yourself in subjection to your husband, whether good or bad, whether healthy or unhealthy, because he's saying, man, maybe that's unjust. We talked about that a few weeks ago. You can go back and listen to that message online. But then today in verse seven, he goes, okay, husbands, let me speak to you now. We've talked about submitting to God. We've talked about submitting to authority, governing authority. We've talked about wives submitting to your husbands. And now he says, husbands, what is your role? What does a Christian husband look like? So here it is. Let's talk about the call for Christian husbands. Let's start where Peter does. Peter wants to admonish the Christian husband to set a framework of the heart and the attitude to be a godly husband in your home. And he just gives us three very simple things to apply to our lives. So if you're in the room this morning and you're a Christian husband, hear these and hear these well. If you're single, hear them. Take them down because there might be a day that you're married. Number one, understand your wife. Understand. It sounds simple, doesn't it? Right? As, as Peter says it, it, it sounds like a simple thing to do. Look at first part of verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. So in, in the room, I, I'm just curious, how, how, many, how many husbands in the room, put your hand in the air, loud and proud, all the husbands, yeah, all the married husbands, great, a lot of you, go ahead, put your hand down. How many of you husbands understand your wife completely? Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> huh. 
Our percentage went way down there, like way, way down, right? No, no surprise, no, no surprise. One of the biggest mysteries in life are women. <laughs> yeah, 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 like men are resonating with this, right? Like they know. See, God created men to be simple, to be common, to be, we really are just ordinary creatures, right? We're not very impressive on, on a larger scale. We're really not. Whereas women, on the other hand, were created to be complex and layered and mysterious. I've heard some people say this, men are, men are like the, a jeep. They, they, they are built like a jeep. They're functional, they're simple, and they're made simply just to get the job done. Where women, on the other hand, are like a Rolls Royce. They're beautiful, they're intelligent, they're made for luxury, and the engineering is complex. I love it. Yeah, the, yeah, the women are getting into this now. Yeah. It's like, okay, preach, let's go. <laughs> but because of the difference between men and women, men have a difficulty understanding who women are. And that's why Peter hits us right between the eyes. And he says this, you want to be a godly husband? You want to fulfill the role God has called you to be? Start with this, understand who she is. Understand her, know her. Know her intimately. Know who she really is. And, and I love this because in Peter, it's a little hard to see, but he says, live with your wives in an understanding way. The word understanding in the Greek is one of my favorite Greek words in the entire language. We talked about it a few weeks ago. It's gnosko. Gnosko literally means intimate, deep, transparent knowledge. So what Peter is doing here, he's saying this to Christian husbands, know your wife intimately. Know her deeply. Truly know who she is. See, the encouragement is to know everything about her. Know her background. Know, know how she was raised. Know who she is. Know her hopes. Know her dreams. Know her heartaches. Truly know your wife. Know her at the deepest level that she can be known. And here's the reality. Every woman on the planet will agree with this. They want to be known. And they want to be known intimately. Now, obviously, God is the greatest knower of who we are. But if you're a married woman, you can honestly say and probably agree with me that you want to be known intimately by your husband. So husbands, part of our calling, and Peter points it out this morning, is to truly know your wife. Now, there's two kinds of men in the room right now. Some are sitting here going, boy, Aaron, that sounds like a lot of work. Well, welcome to marriage. It's work, right? And, and it's just what we're called to do. There's, an, there's other men in the room that are saying, you know what, that sounds good. Sounds like something I want. How do I do that? I don't know how to know her intimately, how to really know her, right? Like, like there's a lot of men that walk around life going, I don't know how to crack the safe. I've been, I've been married for 20 years. I've tried to crack the safe. I still haven't cracked it. Let me give you an equation that will help. This works with your relationship with Jesus Christ. It works for any man-made relationship. It's time plus attention equals intimacy. Time plus attention equals intimacy, meaning what I give my time to, what I give my attention to will equal or move me into some level of intimacy, some level of knowledge. And so if you are a Christian husband this morning and you want to truly follow scripture as Peter has laid it out for us to know your wife, I would say this, give her time and give her attention, give her your time and give her your attention. You will get to know her in a way that you need to know her. Live it out. Apply it to your life. Secondly, Peter says this, not only understand your wife, but honor your wife. Honor her. And today is a bit of a, stair, a staircase. It's a progression, meaning once that you spend time and attention getting to know your wife and you get to know her, that knowledge will lead you somewhere. And where that knowledge leads the Christian man is to a place where they will honor their wife. In other words, they will see their wife as God sees their wife. Look at the second part of verse 7, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel. Peter is saying here that Christian husbands 
that spend time with their wives, that give their wives attention, will truly know her, but as they know her, they will see their wife as God sees them. In other words, extremely valuable, worthy of honor, worthy of praise, worthy of loving them the way they need to be loved. See, Peter encourages us to honor our wives because they have immense value. We're going to talk a little bit more about their value here in a moment. But I do want to address this phrase because Peter uses it. He says, honor your wife as a weaker vessel. And I know what some of you women here are, are, are thinking right now. You're getting offended and say, well, you can't call me the weaker vessel. Two weeks ago, we just talked about the power of women and, and the power that they have through God's creation. But let me, let me make sure you understand what Peter is saying here because he's not referring to your lack of strength, women. He's not referring to your lack of strength emotionally or morally or spiritually. He's just making a general statement how God generally has created man and woman physically and generally men are physically stronger. And there's a reason why that, because see, he knew that the curse was coming. He knew that the fall was coming. There was going to be curse. And if you look at those curses, it says the curse to the man is that he's going to curse the ground, meaning we get to work the ground and we get to get up every day and we get to go to work and work as hard and work as a struggle. And so out of God's sovereign design, he has generally created men to be stronger than women. So he's just talking about the physical strength. And again, I know that there are, there are exceptions to the rule. Some women can be physically stronger, but this is just a generalization that Peter wants to remind us. And he says, it doesn't matter if you have a physically weak woman or if you have a physically strong woman, it doesn't change. He says, honor her, honor that woman. It's part of your calling as a Christian husband. This phrase, understand, is not taking a shot at women. It's really a challenge to men. Men, step up honor her, love her, and the work that you do, work for her. It's a good thing to work hard, to provide not only for your family, but for your wife. We're going to talk about provision here in a few moments, but my goal in life has always been, God, may I work hard enough so that I can make enough money so that hope, my wife Hope doesn't have to work. Now, if she wants to work, great, knock yourself out. But if you don't, you don't have to go out and, and work for money. And so instead, she decides to rebuild houses and to shovel our lawn and to shovel our driveway and chop wood and carry water and all the other things that she loves to do. That's her strength. That's what she loves to do. But part of my gift to her is to work hard enough where she has the freedom to do whatever she wants to do. I call that my love for her. So men, honor her. And again, your, your wife's going to be different than mine. They're not all the same. They're not all, not all built the same. So honor her the way she needs to be honored. Number three, Peter says this, see your wife as royalty. I love where he goes here. This is so interesting. Earlier in the week, I showed my notes to some of the women in the office because sometimes I have to check to make sure I'm on the right track. And one of them said this, ooh, I like point number three a lot. She, she really liked that, right? She, she likes the, the term royalty. And there are some cultures, even in today's age, where men view their wives as queens. Have, have, you, ever, have, you, have you ever been in one of those cultures where, where the men will say, hey, let me introduce you to my queen? Or, oh, get, get, come here, my queen, my queen. That, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful respect and honor in those cultures, and I love that. However, Peter takes us to a different level of royalty this morning. Look at Look at the next part of verse 7, 7c. Seven he says this, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. See, I love the respect and honor that Peter here gives to Christian wives. See, the women that we are married to, they're not just our wife. They, Peter says they're fellow heirs to the very throne of God. In other words, the woman that you are married to isn't just your wife. She's your sister in Christ. Christ died for her just like, she died, just like he died for you. 
And he says this, she is a fellow heir. In other words, she is royalty in God's eyes. So she, if she's royalty in God's eyes, she must be royalty in your eyes. So see her that way. Speak those words to her and treat her that way. See her as royalty. She's an heir with you of the grace of God. Of life. Look at Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Do you see what's going on there? We are, heir, we are all heirs to the throne of grace. Every believer in the room, male or female, it doesn't matter. If God has called you to himself, you're, you're an adopted child. You, you have an heir of the very throne of God in eternity. That is an amazing promise in scripture. And so here, Peter pulls from that thought and he says this, Christian men, see your wives as fellow heirs, not as servants, not as lesser than, not as someone to boss around or, or to help you with the things you want help with. See her as the queen. See, see her as heir to the throne of the grace of God, just like you. See, here's, here's the reality. Peter wants to remind Christian men that we don't have the monopoly on God. We don't have the monopoly on his word. We don't have the monopoly on the Holy Spirit. Every believer does, male or female. See, the hard reality is that there are some men, especially over the course of, a, of church history, where they've taken this headship and this leadership, and they use that to suppress women, to put women in their place, to control women, or worse yet, to abuse women. And let me say this, men, if you are using God's word in an inappropriate way, to suppress women, to control women, or worse, abuse women, I'm going to tell you this right out of my heart. You're the biggest coward on the planet. That's not being a man at all. See, being a man means that you understand God has given you the greatest gift in life. And that's a fellow partner who is a fellow heir to the throne of grace. Treat her as such. Because guess what? She has the Holy Spirit living in her. She can read God's word just like you can. She can study just like you can. She can apply it just like you can. So treat her as the royal queen that she is. It's, it's as if Peter is saying, men, wake up and see your wife the way God sees her. She's a fellow heir to the grace of life. Therefore, tell her that and treat her that way. So three simple things for Christian husbands to apply this morning. But those three things, if we apply them, come with benefit. And so I want to talk about the benefit of loving your wife this way. Because Peter concludes this brief encouragement to Christian husbands this way. Look at the last part of verse 7. He says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. I love that. <laughs> he says this. He says, if you love your wife the way the way you're supposed to, the, the way God calls us to love our wives, in other words, if, if we truly honor her, if we see her royalty, if we know her intimately, that comes with benefit. You know what one of the benefits is? That God hears and answers our prayer. But see, the converse is also true. If we don't treat our wives well, and if we don't follow Scripture's mandate to be the godly leader in the home, our prayers are going to hit the ceiling and come right back down. See, and here's the reality. I've experienced this in my own life. When, when I've gone through dark seasons in my life, and when God and I aren't really on the same page, and I, I'm slipping into a dark place, Many times, God will remind me of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, the, the verse we're talking about this morning. And then all of a sudden, I'll be reminded, oh, wait a minute. Not only do I need to get right with God, I need to get right with my wife. Because if I'm not treating her the way God wants me to treat her, my spiritual life will be hindered. And men, I want you to hear that, because a lot of times, men that are married will always blame the wife. It's, marriage is the classic blame game. When things go wrong, well, it's her fault. 
or you, you don't know the woman I'm married to. Well, I don't have to know. I do know this. The way you treat your, right, your wife is a mirror to the intimacy in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And God designed it that way. That's why he said the two will become one, right? There's part of that is, is reality. So if you want the benefit of God hearing your prayer and answering your prayer, then treat your wife well. Love her, like Paul says in Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, which, which means we die to ourself. So we know her deeply. We honor her. We treat her like royalty. We die to ourselves just like Christ died for the church, gave himself up for her. That's how we're to love our wives. So to conclude this morning, I want to give the men in the room three words. Whether you're married or whether you're not, this is for all the men, young men and old men. It doesn't matter because these apply because I, I really believe we live in a day and age where we are not raising men to be men anymore. And, and we see this in our world. We, we're just raising boys. We're, we're raising these young boys who can shave. They're not men. They haven't become men. They haven't taken on responsibility for their life, for their home, for their marriage. See, we're losing our young men today. Listen to these statistics. In 2014, over 7 million American men ages 25 to 54, which are the prime working income earning years, were neither working nor looking for work. Over 7 million American young men thought it was okay to sit on the couch, to lay in the lazy chair, or to hang out in your basement playing video games. And they think that's what it means to be a man. No, it doesn't mean that. How about 2019? 52% of adults between ages 18 and 29 were still living with their parents. And again, I know, I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, it's the economy. The economy changed. Blah, blah, blah. Grow up. Be a man. Get out there and fight. Work. If your work isn't making enough, then work harder. I've had moments in my own life where, I, where I've worked three different jobs, one of them being a church planner because I'm, I'm called to plant churches. So in order to plant the church, I work two other jobs to pay for everything else so that my queen will be taken care of. She hates it when I call her that. <laughs> that, that that's why I laugh. <laughs> How about this? In 2021, one in three U.S. adults between the ages of 18 and 34, again, were still living with their parents. See, there's a reason why my wife and I bought a house that doesn't have a basement. <laughs> Just kidding. We have kids that would never want to live with me um, again. <laughs> Uh, so, men, here you go. The call to Christian men, I'm going to end with three, these three words, and we'll be done. You've been gracious to me. Lead, provide, and protect. Number one, men lead. We need men who are leaders. And we see this model all throughout Scripture. You can go all the way back to the Old Testament, Adam and Eve. All the kings and priests and prophets of the Old Testament were leaders. New Testament disciples were leaders. Even in the church age right now, the call for elders is to be a leader, to be pastors, elders, to lead in your homes, lead in the church, lead in your community. And I love some of the qualifications to be an elder. Look at, look at 1 Timothy 3, 4 through 5. This is speaking to the elder. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping ch his children submissive. For if anyone does not know how to manage his own house, household, how will you, he care for God's church? Man, those are serious qualifications to be an elder of a church. Do you see what it says there? It says he must manage or lead his house well. But leave it up there on the screen because there's a key word. And I want you to say it out loud because we can do these things the right way or the wrong way. We can do it with the right attitude or the wrong attitude, the right heart or the wrong heart. Elders must manage their own household well with all, say it out loud, dignity. dignity. It doesn't say heavy handed. It doesn't say with an iron fist. It says with all dignity, meaning we're going to show love and we're going to show grace as we lead. There's a way to lead. See, I've worked with a lot of collegiate athletes. 
And I try to teach them this principle. The how is as important as the what. Meaning, how we get to the destination is as important as the destination itself. Men, it's the same with your leadership. How you lead is as important as with what you're leading or, or what, where you're going in your leadership. It's important. Word number two, provide. Men, we need you to lead and we need you to provide. Be providers. Be providers in the home, be providers in the church, be providers in the community. And if you think this one isn't very strong, listen to the words of Paul in 1 Timothy 5, 8. He says this, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Are you kidding me? Man, I wish I could take this verse to all those 30-year-olds living in their parents' basement playing video games and call themselves a Christian. Those are strong words. If we do not provide for those in our household, we are seen as ones who have denied the faith or unbelievers. In other words, if we do not provide for those in our household, our Christian testimony is in jeopardy. And, and hear this, we're not just talking about financial provision, men. See, this travels far beyond just providing financially. We are, as men, are called to provide emotional security, provide biblical instruction, provide love and wisdom in our home. We are to provide biblical direction with big decision-making in our home and in the church and in the community. See, the, the provision isn't just financial. It goes far beyond that. See, you show me a Christian man that's living out his role. I'll show you a Christian man that is leading well with all dignity and providing financially, emotionally, physically, and spiritually for their family. Again, Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Gave himself up for... Number three, we'll end here, protect. Lead, provide, protect, men. I don't know if you've seen this video. There's a video the last couple of weeks that went viral. Unfortunately, it's of a, uh, of a man on a college campus attacking a young woman. And this attack was brutal, knocked her down to the ground, beat her a little bit, took everything she had, her phone, her backpack, probably had a computer, money, wallet, whatever. He assaulted her. And as bad as that video was and as horrific as that event is, you know what was worse? In the same video, because I watched it three times, in the same video, not 15 feet away from the attack was another young man that just sat there and watched the whole thing happen. A young man sat there and watched another man brutally attack a female. Don't let, me, don't let me be around that guy. Because he's not a man. He's a boy who can shave. That's all he is. See, God calls Christian men to protect. Protect the women around us. Protect the church. Protect our communities. And again, Ephesians 5 says this, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave himself up. Yeah, he laid his life down, but guess what? Jesus didn't stop there. He is still the head of the church, meaning his bride is important to him. He loves his bride. He protects her. He guides her. He leads her. That's, that's the role Jesus is playing right now in the Big C Church Universal and the, in this local church. I can give you story after story after story how God has protected this church. Part of who he is as men, why are we not fulfilling that role of protection? And again, I'm using the word protection in a larger sense than just the physical protection. Protect your family from physical harm, but how about emotional harm and mental harm and spiritual harm? That's part, that's part of the protection. When you hear false teaching or false things in the community in your home, you need to lead out and say, hey, Hey, guys, what, what's wrong with that thinking? Does that align with Scripture or does it doesn't align with Scripture? That, that's part of how we protect in our homes spiritually. So that's a positive side of protection. Let me, let me end with talking about the negative side of protection. 
What happens when men don't engage? What happens when men don't protect? What happens when men don't speak? Well, let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. We'll see what happens. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight in her eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and also gave some to her husband. Key phrase here, who was with her? And she ate. And he ate. See, some think that the first sin was Eve. Some, some say, oh, Eve was the first one to sin. She, she talked to the serpent, and she picked the fruit, and she ate it first, and then she gave it to her husband. I disagree. The first sin was Adam. The first sin was the sin of silence. Adam, Scripture says, was there the entire time, and he did nothing. He didn't lead. He didn't provide. He didn't protect. He sat back and let the whole thing happen, and guess what? Sin entered the world because Adam did nothing. And we see it in our society today. And it breaks the heart of God to see men continuing to do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. So I'm going to end this service like I did last week. I want to highlight our men and I want to pray for the men. And, and I want us to connect both. We, we talked about being a multi-generational church. We need elderly people in our lives and we need younger people in our lives and everything in between. So in light of that, in light of needing connections, so if you're an older individual and you want to pass off some of your wisdom and knowledge, either male or female to the younger generation, we have a QR code behind me. Just hit that, fill out the form and say, hey, I, I just want to connect with somebody. No pressure. The office will try to match people. If you're a younger one, do the same thing. Hit the QR code and say, hey, I'm somebody younger. I'd, I'd like somebody in my life. I'd like some accountability. I'd, I'd, learn, I'd like to learn how to be a man. Maybe, maybe I didn't have a father in my life. Maybe I had nobody to help challenge me. So whether you're male, female, young or old, hit the QR code and say, hey, I just, I just want to connect with somebody. Have a conversation. Nothing formal. Office will try to match young and old. It's our way of actually applying some of the truth to our lives that we hear. Because it's important. So I want to pray for the men this morning. If you're a man 50 years and older, go ahead and stand up with me, please. 50 years and older, our older men in the room, please stand. If you can. <laughs> wow, that took, whoo, come on, guys. Lunch is cooking. That took, that took some time. No, I'm kidding. Uh, look around the room. These are our older men. If you're one of the younger ones sitting down, take note of these guys. You, you can probably learn a thing or two. I had a couple of guys first service right up here in front that have probably spoken more into my life in the last year and a half than, than I've had my entire life. And I admitted, I need these guys in my life. But you know what? I also need the younger generation in my life. I spend a lot of time with younger people, and I love it, and I learn from them. We need both. So younger men, if you're 50, if you're under 50, go ahead and stand. We need everybody. All the men, stand. Men, you're needed. You're needed now more than ever in our world and in our society. You're needed in your home, you're needed in this church, and you're needed in the community. So hear this well. You are the future of the church. You're the future of the gospel. And I don't care if you have kids, grandkids, no kids, doesn't matter. God wants men to step up, to lead, provide, protect. I want to be a leader of a church with real men who show up ready to engage, ready to disciple, ready to be true men led by the Spirit of God through His grace. I, don't, I want to be around a bunch of pretenders. I want to be around a bunch of boys who can shave or who are playing the game or who just put on their little Christian 
name tag every week and, and check something off the list. Men, we need you and we need you to engage. So let me pray for you. God, thank you for these men that are standing. I pray right now you would move in their heart and in their spirit that they would engage with you and with your kingdom. I pray that the older would give in to the younger and would mentor the younger. I pray that the younger would seek out mentors to, to learn from, to, to follow a model and an example. And God, that we would be a healthy, thriving, multi-generational church for the glory of God and for the gospel and fame of Jesus Christ. So stir these men, may they be leaders, may they be providers and protectors in their homes, the workplace, in the church, and in their community. Pray all these things in Christ's name, amen. Women, please stand with us and we will close in a song. So before we close, just a reminder, there will be prayer partners here at the front of the stage, open and available to you if you need any prayer today or just someone to talk to, they will be accessible for you. Let's sing together as we close.